Paul's letter to the Galatians has been influential for its theological and ethical insights, especially Galatians 5.25, which suggests the Christian life is led by the Spirit. This verse captures the dynamic between is and ought, indicative of what is already true and what should be done, known as the indicative imperative model. The article reviews this model, most notably developed by Rudolf Bultmann, and challenges its understanding of Christian ethics according to Paul. The paper criticizes the indicative imperative model, part one, examines alternatives, part two, and presents a more dynamic relationship of divine and human agency, part three. The designation Paul's ethics does not imply a systematic exploration of Christian conduct. Rather, it refers to the practical conduct of Christ's followers drawing heavily on Paul's basic theological positions. The study of the indicative-imperative relationship is viewed as a central element of understanding Paul's ethics. Also, Rabins discusses the concept of indicative and imperative in ethical theology, rooted in German scholarship, particularly at the Protestant faculty at the University of Mainz. These terms are challenged by some scholars who believe the approach is outdated or flawed. Friedrich W. Horn and Ruben Zimmermann published a critical work in 2009 called Beyond Indicative and Imperative, which included various articles questioning this traditional ethical approach. Zimmermann goes as far as suggesting a complete move away from these concepts towards a model of implicit ethics. Rabin specifically analyzes Zimmermann's critique of the indicative-imperative approach, using the biblical book of Galatians as an example. Throughout this examination, Rabin's considers the dynamic interplay between divine and human agency in Paul's theological ethics. He concludes by affirming that Zimmerman's critique of the indicative and imperative terminology is justified, as these terms may be inadequate or misleading in describing the nuanced biblical understanding of ethics. However, Robbins disagrees with Zimmerman's outright rejection of the approach, suggesting that the indicative-imperative approach itself offers valuable insights and should not be entirely discarded. Moreover, Rabins discusses and responds to various criticisms of an influential interpretation of Paul's epistles. In response to the claim that the indicative-imperative division contradicts the structure of Paul's letters, Rabins notes that Paul's work is indeed not split along these lines. For example, in Galatians, ethical instruction is dispersed throughout, not confined to the second half as often suggested. However, Rabins maintains that the indicative-imperative approach still holds value as a reflection of a thread of Paul's thought showing the interplay between his theological beliefs, indicated by indicative, and ethical mandates, indicated by imperative. The claim that certain content can't be classified as either indicative or imperative is addressed by Rabin's agreeing that such categorization can be challenging, but proposing the idea of implicit indicative and imperative forms in Paul's letters. This expands the categories to include not only explicit grammatical instances of is, indicative, and ought, imperative, but also implicit expressions of the same. On the assertion that Paul never derives the imperative from the indicative, Rabins accepts Paul does not explicitly explain the relationship between these two, but he suggests the relationship still exists. For instance, in Galatians 5.25, Paul implies a causal relationship, where an ethical action, walk by the Spirit, is rooted in a prior theological truth, live by the Spirit. Rabins concludes that these criticisms have raised valid points, but they are not enough to dismiss the indicative-imperative interpretation of Paul's epistles completely. Instead, the critique moves the approach to incorporating broader expressions beyond the grammatical forms and acknowledging subtle and implicit relationships between theological belief and ethical action. Furthermore, Rabin's responds to a critique of Zimmermann's indicative-imperative schema. This model has been described as rigid and inaccurate due to its implication that there's an order of importance between the indicative, indicating a fact or existence, and imperative, indicating a command. Rabin's counters that while no explicit order of precedence is defined, divine agency is often shown as a precursor in Paul's writings. For instance, God is shown as initiating redemption and adoption in Galatians 4, 4 5. Notably, this precedence doesn't make the indicative and imperative relationship rigid, but instead contributes to the dynamism and variety in Paul's ethical reasoning. Another criticism is that the indicative-imperative schema imposes division on what Paul presents as a unity. To this, Rabins argues that the model is effective in addressing Paul's theology and ethics, particularly regarding the roles of divine and human agency. Divine agency is portrayed as either the outcome of or actual ongoing transformative processes, while imperatives embody human agency, which depends on God. In addition, Rabins notes that divine and human agency can be understood through three distinct correlations 
though Zimmerman supports the second model where both share an essentially identical agency. However, Rabins contends that these cannot always correspond. For instance, while Paul often emphasizes divine agency and salvation, human agency is sometimes required to ensure alignment with divine intent. Therefore, Zimmerman would need to find additional support in Paul's work to claim that the indicative imperative model splits the unity that Paul intended. Lastly, Rabin's responds to the critique that moral obligation and capability aren't central concepts in Pauline theology. He suggests that despite not being at the core of Paul's thought, the idea does emerge within Paul's teachings on religious ethical life. For instance, it arises in discussions about ethical challenges and the potential struggle to live according to love ethics. Overall, Rabin's debates that the indicative imperative model remains useful for understanding Pauline theology. Further, Rabin's responds to Criticism 7, which suggests a tension within Pauline theology concerning indicative and imperative notions causing complications regarding God's gift of salvation. The critic disputes that if humans must act to complete salvation, it denotes an incomplete and limited salvation. Rabin's accentuates that the entanglement of is and ought in Paul's letters is what the critic is referencing. Attempting to explain this relationship with either indicative and imperative unity, or by affirming divine action over human intervention, is two ways forward. Rabin's contends, however, that the critic fails to clarify his view of divine and human action in Pauline theology. Rabin's suggests an apparent absence of divine agency in the critic's ethical approach to Pauline ethics. Contrary to the critic's argument, this tension does not invalidate the indicative and imperative model. It is only a label given to describe this relationship neither does it endorse one particular reading of the relationship, as evidenced by the diverging views of Boltman and Furnish. Interestingly, Rabin's observes potentially unresolvable problems concerning God's gift of salvation directly in Paul's teachings, for instance in Galatians 6, 8. He implies that the Galatians will only receive eternal life if they act in according to the Spirit, showcasing the same tension underlying the indicative and imperative model. Besides, the indicative imperative approach, often used in interpreting the work of Apostle Paul, has been criticized for lacking precision in describing the details of Paul's moral reasoning. However, this critique is met with the acknowledgement that while the indicative imperative model only focuses on one aspect of Paul's ethics, it is nonetheless valid as it relates to other dimensions such as identity and ethics. To gain a comprehensive understanding of Paul's ethical discourse, a wider perspective is needed. Zimmerman's method offers such a perspective. In sum, the critique from a linguistic standpoint is the only substantially valid one. The terms indicative and imperative are primarily grounded in grammar. Hence, a revised terminology, implicit indicatives and implicit imperatives, is suggested. These terms capture the constitutive is and appellative ought elements of Paul's ethics, encompassing the various statements of is and ought in his theological discourse. They engage with the relational model of Paul's theology and ethics, indicating both the gift, Gabe, and the task, off gaby elements, without forcing them into a singular model. Despite terminological limitations, the indicative imperative model can still be a valuable tool in interpreting Paul's theology and ethics. Additionally, in exploring the ethical dimension of St. Paul's thought as expressed in Galatians, Rabin's critiques the traditional model that focuses on a singular, indicative imperative, and relies on Zimmerman's model of implicit ethics. This model identifies eight aspects of Paul's theology and ethics, moving beyond the indicative imperative by incorporating a wider set of reasons and grounds for ethical living. These aspects include the linguistic form of ethical statements, leading norms for action, tradition history of norms, logic of values, ethical argumentation, the ethical subject, implemented ethos, and field application. Rabin's debates Zimmerman's model overlooks a crucial element of Paul's ethics, the role of divine agency, he suggests incorporating this concept into the model. As per Rabin's, for Paul, humans are transformed and enabled to live ethically because of divine intervention. Zimmerman's model aims to understand the grounds and motivation of Paul's ethics, but Rabin's, focusing on enabling grounds, believes it neglects the influence of divine and human action. Rabin's critiques another critique of the indicative imperative schema by Udo Schnella, who asserts transformation and participation. Although Schnella's approach acknowledges transformation through divine agency, Rabin's disputes it may be too static to capture the dynamic nature of Pauline ethics in Galatians, especially in reference to living by the Spirit. In short, Rabin's commends Zimmerman's model for its wider scope, beyond the indicative imperative, but proposes an amendment to include divine agency, a key aspect of Pauline ethics.
He suggests further, more nuanced discussions on transformation brought about by divine enabling within Pauline ethics discourse. Also in his analysis, Rabbins applies Zimmerman's model of implicit ethics to the Epistle to the Galatians to understand how Paul's ethical teachings shape its readers. Rabins explores how Galatians presents the conception of ethical life empowered by the Spirit, particularly through the phrases walking in line with the Spirit and living in the Spirit, used in Galatians 5.25. Here, Rabins suggests, Paul was not merely speaking metaphorically, but was invoking a shared religious experience among his audience. Rabins argues that walking by the Spirit, as defined by Paul in Galatians 5.16, means not gratifying the desires of the flesh, an interpretation supported by its contrast with the concepts of the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. Rabins further illuminates his point through a close reading of Galatians 3 and 4, where Paul first mentions the life-transforming activity of the Spirit. These chapters establish that the Galatians' Christian life started with an existential experience of the Spirit, which became a significant and formative force. Rabins further expands on this concept by discussing the Spirit's empowerment through drawing people towards God, done through familial or intimate language. The work of the Spirit is seen by Paul as the force that transformed, taught, and guided the Galatians' religious ethical life. They no longer needed law as a moral code, as they had a direct transformative relationship with God through the Spirit. This relationship grants them the ability to live according to the values of the Spirit and honor their Heavenly Father. Rabins finds this exercise of the Spirit reiterated in Romans 8, with the Spirit facilitating the believer's ethical behavior. He concludes that in both texts, the Spirit's role is to empower and provide criteria for living as children of God, a clear indication of Paul's ethics in these scriptures. Last but not least, Rabins presents a reevaluation of Pauline ethics. Rabins claims that applying Zimmerman's model of implicit ethics to the Epistle of Galatians, it becomes evident that the combination of the concepts indicative and imperative only serves as one part of the ethical ground of the text. He contends that this perspective should be supplemented by acknowledging the divine agency, which is currently excluded in favor of human agency. Moreover, Rabin states that the experiences of the transformative and empowering dynamics of the Spirit should be held paramount to the believer's ethical actions or feelings of being emotionally close to God. Furthermore, Rabin's debates that the Pauline concept of indicative and imperative or statements of fact and command can be further understood through understanding the interconnectedness of divine and human agency in the text. In addition, Rabin's highlights that living in the grace of the Spirit isn't a state that needs to be catalyzed by the deeds of the believers. Instead, it is about the followers' consistent experiences of God's empowerment and transformative influence that brings them closer to God and the community of faith. Further, this relation allows for maintaining the individuality of the spirit and the believer, thus distinguishing the believer's moral character and his ethical actions. In sum, Rabin suggests that believers, in their continual interaction with the spirit and the community of faith, are empowered to manifest the values set out by Paul in his gospel leading to a deeper relationship with God and other believers. This ongoing interaction with the Spirit is not only a continuation of life in the Spirit, but is also key for further unfolding the divine gift of life in the Spirit. In conclusion, Rabins critically examines interpretations of Apostle Paul's ethical instruction in letters such as Galatians. Specifically, Rabins critiques the indicative imperative model where morality is seen as following theological truths. He disputes the model, developed by Rudolf Bultmann, has limitations describing nuanced relationships between theology and ethics in the Bible, and critics like Reuben Zimmerman argue for updated models focusing on implicit ethics. However, Rabins believes the indicative imperative approach offers valuable insights despite its limitations. Besides, he criticizes Zimmerman's perspective for excluding the role of divine agency or the transformative power of God's spirit in human ethical behavior. Rabins indicates the interplay of divine and human agency in Paul's ethics, with divine agency initiating the transformative process and the imperatives representing human trying to align with God's will. He suggests a redefined version of the model wherein divine and human agency are seen as interconnected, incorporates broader expressions beyond grammatical forms, and acknowledges the role of the Holy Spirit. Additionally, Rabins urges for continued nuanced discourse on divine-human interaction in the understanding of Pauline ethics. In his analysis of the Epistle to the Galatians, Rabin suggests an ethical life empowered by the Spirit, marked by a transformative relationship with God, forms the cornerstone of Paul's theological ethics. 
Finally, he proffers a continual interaction with the Spirit, being exposed to God's empowerment and transformative influence resulting in manifesting the values professed by Paul in his teachings.